And the second really important reason why behaviour matters is um, that they are key drivers of health inequalities. Um, there is this staggering difference between people who live in poorer communities and people in richer communities. If you uh, live in a poorer community, you can expect to spend, on average, 19 uh, more years of your life in poor health. That's a huge difference. And the key reason for that are what we call the, the, the uh, big four behaviours. So that's people's diets, their physical activity levels, uh, whether people are smoking or not, and uh, excessive um, alcohol consumption. Those are, those are really um, you know, explaining the difference. So if we want to address those health inequalities, um, not to forget, it's really important that we address the wider determinants of health, uh, because poverty is really driving uh, a lot of uh, these inequalities. Also the environments in, pe in, in which people live, uh, things like poor housing. Um, but in addition to that, we also need uh, interventions to support behavior change that are based on uh, theory and evidence of what works. And my work has mainly focused on sort of individual and group level <coughs> interventions. But also obviously it's really important that we have interventions that um, you know, focus on changing the environment in which people live and, um, and those wider determinants. So I'm going to talk first about um, behavioural insights have moved us to uh, uh, go beyond common sense. And as I said, we all have got theories and our own ideas about how to change behaviour, how to eat a healthy diet. And, uh, and a lot of professionals and health professionals have done that as well, and policy makers. And there's quite often this thing like you need to get the message across and you need to give people information because knowledge is really important. Um, and whenever I've met with um, sort of patients and members of the public when I was developing new research, they often said, well, you just need to scare people and say, you know, if you're not, not going to change your diet, you're going to end up you know, dying early or you're going to end up taking a lot of medication. And so that's what I've sort of called common sense theories. And, um, and we know that you know, it's not that easy, that those sort of things and scaring people um, does not really help in isolation to support behavior change. Um, so in my career, and I was just thinking back, it was a good 25 years, I think, and uh, I sort of properly started, I think, when I joined the University of Cambridge in 1997. Um, I've always been really fascinated by not just you know, doing research, but also how we do research and, and finding out ways to improve um, how we do research. And this is me on my um, PhD graduation day in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, uh, really, really happy day. Um, and uh, in 20, it was 2005, I, I published a paper with colleagues in Cambridge about a causal modeling approach. And I was really interested in how interventions uh, lead to behavior change, so that black box. And uh, my PhD was very much on, on that topic as well. And sort of moving forward to uh, last year when I um, published a, a chapter with my uh, wonderful colleague Nelly Hankone from Finland on um, a whole chapter about the steps to take in developing behavior change interventions where we sort of um, distilled all our wisdom of, of doing research over the years. And um, I think what, we, what I can say, sort of having been through this journey of 25 years, there's a lot of developments that uh, have taken place in behavioural science, a lot of tools and frameworks that have been developed that um, have helped us to develop and, and evaluate um, behaviour change interventions. And I've been involved in a few, and I think one of the ones that I'm sort of proudest of um, being involved in, a, a wonderful project led, led by Susan Mickey, um, from University uh, College London, was to look about what the active ingredients were of behaviour change interventions. And that came about because we, we know, you know, when you have a tablet, you know what the active ingredients are. But yet, when we have behaviour change interventions, there seems to be this real black box. And people publish their research and describe their interventions. And at the time when you read that, then there was like, things like we did behavioural modification or gave brief advice. And that's all very general. That's the, you can't really replicate that. Um, and people use different terms for different things. And that really limits our understanding of you know, building a good evidence base of what works to uh, support behavior change. 
Um, so we got together and um, a, a wonderful team was supported by um, ex international experts and um, uh, applied for funding to um, develop a tool called a taxonomy that, was a, that we aim to develop sort of a shared language for how we describe our behavior change interventions. And I think we had two or three goals at uh, getting funding and, and got rejected. And, but we did feel this was a good idea and we persisted and Susan was really, really good at leading the team in that. And, and finally got funded by the Medical Research Council. And so I think that's always my message and every scientist in the room here knows it's so hard to get funding and you get so many rejections. But if you think your idea is good, rework it, try again. Um, and this taxonomy has been very influential. It's been used, uh, sort of taken up around the world. Um, it's used for what we call evidence synthesis. So um, it's basically when other people um, publish their research about behavior change interventions, you can use this taxonomy to sort of extract exactly what uh, behavior change techniques were included. And I forgot to mention behavior change techniques are things like goal, uh, setting goals, um, for instance, to be more physically active, keeping track of progress, building behavior change into a habit. And it's also helped us to uh, describe, to develop and report our interventions in ways that you know, other people can see what, you know, what actually what we have done. So it really helps to build an evidence base. So um, the end product was, um, you can see that on the left hand side, a taxonomy with 93 behavior change techniques. And um, so 93 ways to to change behavior. And I remember sitting in my garden in Cambridge when we sort of want to see what, be, what techniques were there. And I had this whole heap of clinical psychology textbooks sort of highlighting all the techniques that were mentioned there. And I remember coming across the, the turtle technique, which hasn't made it into the taxonomy. But um, so there are these 93 techniques. And for each of the techniques, we have got a very clear label. And you can see it on the right hand side for goal setting. I'm not sure if you can read it well, but a clear uh, definition um, that everyone can understand. And then some examples. Um, so for goal setting, the definition is to set or agree with a person on a goal defined in terms of the behavior to be achieved. And an example there is to agree on a daily walking uh, goal with a person. So this is sort of the shared language that we developed over time and has been really taken up um, by yeah, a lot of um, scientists and also uh, beyond in, in practice and policy. And I just wanted to give some examples of how the taxonomy had been used. And I just want to highlight work of one of my PhD students um, who has supervised Jennifer James at the University of Liverpool. Um, she was really interested in physical activity interventions after bariatric surgery. So that's after weight loss uh, surgery. So helping people who had surgery to be more physically active. And she did a literature review to see what, um, what had been done and found 12 uh, interventions. And they were usually quite structured exercise classes um, um, delivered by a physiotherapist or, or another, um, like for instance, fitness instructor. And we found during this review that there was sort of mixed evidence. So some of the interventions were successful in helping people to become more active and others weren't. But we were particularly, and Jennifer was particularly interested in finding out what the interventions actually consisted of. So we, we read all the descriptions and tried to use the taxonomy to find out what, um, what had been done. And we found like very often that these interventions are very poorly described. We couldn't really work out what had been done. Um, and we also found when we used the taxonomy that some interventions, we could find four behavior change techniques in it, another 19. So a huge range of techniques included. But we were able to find that you know, sort of the common techniques that were used were um, giving people inst instructions on how to be active, demonstrating the physical activities, um, encouraging people to set goals, practicing physical activity and um, action planning. So a clear plan for where, when and how uh, people were going to be active. So from the literature, using a tool, we're able to find out techniques that could be promising to include um, in, in a future intervention. And I think what's also really fascinating is to find out what techniques are not included. And so there are many techniques that we know about problem solving around barriers, um, monitoring physical activity, building activity into a habit, were not included in these interventions. So 
um, Jennifer then went on to, uh, to develop her own intervention. So that's one way of how the taxonomy has helped us to extract from the literature of what works. And another way which has been used, an example of my own work again, is how we describe and report our interventions so that other people can replicate it. And this was a big program of research, um, uh, physical activity interventions, very brief, delivered in five minutes in primary care by a practice nurse or a healthcare assistant. <coughs> And you'd usually have in a, in a journal article, you would have these things on the left-hand side. There was like a face-to-face -face discussion, uh, some feedback was given, a step counter was handed out, and there was a booklet as well. Um, but what we did once we had developed this whole intervention, we then sort of used the taxonomy to really specify in detail what behavior change techniques we had included in this five-minute intervention. And I think sort of to a surprise, you can, do, <laughs> you can deliver quite a lot of behavior change techniques in, in five minutes. So that's an example of how the taxonomy has helped us to um, report our interventions and describe them better so other people can replicate them. So that was the sort of the bit about the taxonomy. Um, and I now want to move on to the question, you know, beyond does it work? Does an intervention change behavior? And really, and I think that's been a real story through my research of being interested to find out how interventions uh, work to change behavior, when and for whom. So, you know, if people change their physical activity, is it because, you know, you're monitoring on a piece of paper how much you're doing? Is it through socialist support? Do interventions work as well for men and women? Um, if you have a healthy eating intervention delivered face to face, could it work if you deliver it by smartphone app? And I could probably fill two days talking about this, so I had to be sort of a bit uh, selective in what I present and really focusing mostly on the question how interventions work and why. And one of the things I, um, another really wonderful initiative that I got involved with was um, um, guidance for, um, for process evaluation. And I'd always been really interested in this black box between the intervention and the outcome. And, and other people, one of my, the colleagues, my colleagues as well, and we used to receive lots of emails of people said, I need to do a process evaluation, what do I do? And so we got together and thought, well, maybe there's a need for, for some guidance to help other researchers and practitioners do uh, a process e evaluation. And so process evaluation is really about not just does the intervention work or does it not work, but explaining whether intervention actually delivered and engaged with as planned, how people, uh, how they change behavior, um, those interventions, or why not? Because quite often we find it's, it's difficult to change behavior and how people uh, make changes. And that sort of evidence is really important because um, if you're a, a policy maker, you're working in practice, you're not just interested in the question, does it work? You want to know, does it work in my setting? Does it work with my population? And if I understand how an intervention, you know, if it only works when people are very motivated, then it may not work in a setting where people uh, lack that motivation. So we um, developed the, the guidance. It was really, really a fantastic project. And all the Medical Research Council guidance before us had a, had a figure. So we also thought we really have to produce a figure. And this is what we came up with. And uh, um, I remember sitting hours in the, in the Medical Research Council head office in London and being rather distracted by the wonderful view <laughs> over, over London. But this is the, the diagram we came up uh, with in the end. And I'm not going to explain much in detail, but on the left hand side, with the red box around it, that's the intervention, the description of an intervention. It might be a training manual for health practitioners. It may be group sessions that you've developed for healthy eating. And then on the red box on the, on the right, we've got the outcomes, which are you know, behaviors, physical activity, dietary change. And there's all this stuff in the middle with the black boxes around it, the, the delivery of the intervention, how people engage with it, the context in which these interventions are um, are delivered and all of those have an impact on, on the outcomes. And it's sort of that bit, that messy bit in the middle that involves people that I've been really interested in. And I remember when I was working in Cambridge, um, um, you know, we had this, this sort of intervention I'm going to talk about in a moment, but people were around the table were really interested in measuring physical activity really precisely. And I sat there and I thought, I'm really interested in what happens 
in the middle and uh, because you know that's about people isn't it and uh, really wanted to understand that better so one of the things that I was interested um, in early on was um, whether interventions, if we develop them as research, are they actually delivered as plans? And so when we've got an intervention that doesn't uh, result in behavior change, quite, you could conclude, well, the intervention wasn't effective. But unless you measure the delivery, we don't know whether it was the intervention package that wasn't effective or whether it wasn't delivered well. Um, and also, equally, if an intervention changes behavior, that could be due to something else um, that you hadn't designed, I mean, unless you know what was delivered. And my work has really been influenced by, um, it's called the Treatment Fidelity Framework, which was developed by the NIH, and that's really guided my work. So one of my first uh, studies when I joined Cambridge in 1997 was uh, proactive. And that was a um, very intensive one-year physical activity intervention, and that was targeting people at increased uh, risk of developing type 2 diabetes. I think we spent about three years developing the intervention, uh, interviewing people, um, uh, did a, a pilot study as well, so very carefully developed, a very big training manual, and you know, sort of used all the insights about you know, goal setting, monitoring behavior, helping people to um, develop um, habits. And we had very intensive training for the facilitators who were going to deliver this and uh, ongoing support. This was a really intensive intervention. Never do this nowadays. Five one-to-one, -one, uh, one-hour sessions delivered at participants' homes. So my team was driving around a lot and also delivered by telephone. And so we did this really big trial and, um, and sort of the comparison group uh, got this leaflet, and you can see this is a while ago, a leaflet just explaining the benefits of physical activity and saying to people, try and be as active as much as you can. That was it. And we did this huge study and found out that, you know, this very carefully developed intervention was no more effective than this brief advice leaflet. So rather disappointing, but hey, oh, that's science, isn't it? We're, we're there to find evidence whether we, you know, whether, yeah, often we don't find what we hope to find. Um, so I got really interested in knowing, like, what's the delivery, what, what actually happens? And I got small grants from Diabetes UK um, with Susan Mickey and others. And um, we had audio recorded almost all of those uh, sessions. So we then looked, um, it looked at what, what the manual said of what should be delivered and what was delivered in practice and just coded that. And this is what we found. We had 108 audio recorded sessions coded in detail and we found out that less than half of the intervention package was delivered. And, um, and on this diagram you can see sort of on the horizontal axis you can see the uh, different behavior change techniques like goal setting, action planning, um, and you can see 100% adherence will be a robot. You don't want that, but 44%. And I remember we sort of looked and said, oh gosh, this, is this bad or not? But actually no one had really done this work. And, and I think since other people have done similar work and, and find out that you know, this is you know, not a, you know, a very low figure. And actually, I think the most important lesson for me was that I realized that we had it wasn't anything to do with the facilitators. We had developed this Rolls-Royce intervention with everything in it that we could uh, you know, we conceivably think might work. And we just had made it far too complex to deliver in practice. So that was a really good, good lesson for me. That um, you know, it needs to be practicable. Um, so we're moving from this one-year intervention um, to um, completely the other. Um, um, side of the um, continuum, a five-minute intervention. And I'm going to put this slide in as maybe a bit of a diversion, but it just tells you the timelines that's, um, of research. So I, I guess, you know, if there's a health professional here and you think you've got five minutes with a, a patient to uh, help them to become more active, you might spend maybe an afternoon or a few days to come up with some good ideas. But we did this in a big funded research program, five years, um, uh, led by uh, Stephen Sutton in Cambridge. Um, careful work of developing different types of uh, five-minute interventions, testing them out and see whether they were feasible to deliver in, in primary care. So this was in the context of a NHS health check. 
Um, and then we had three sort of a short list of three, which we tried out with almost 400 participants. And then finally, we settled with um, an intervention that was based around a, a step count, um, a pedometer, and then tested this uh, one. Because it was so short, we needed a lot of participants. Over a thousand participants were included over the east of England. And so, is it, did we do any better? And um, so, this was the final study. Um, a five minutes a consultation between a practice nurse and a healthcare assistant in the context of uh, NHS health checks. We had over a thousand participants from the east of England recruited through primary care. They were either randomized, so by sort of a lottery to a health check alone and this health, the health check and a five minute intervention. And then at three months later, we uh, asked them, we sent them questionnaires to find out how, how active they had become. And also we used a, a wrist-worn accelerometer, which measures physical activity precisely. And again, it's sort of a story in my career. We find <laughs> that the five minute intervention was no more effective than the NHS health check alone. So again, I was interested to know, um, you know, what had gone on. And uh, so we, um, we had asked the practice nurses to audio record a few of those and deliver it and, and analyze them. And we thought five minutes was really very brief intervention, but obviously this was far too long for, for routine primary care. So in practice, the duration was no more than three minutes. So it meant that, you know, only about 60% of the intervention was delivered. And also we found out that you know, the things that we thought were really the active ingredients weren't delivered that well. So only one in two participants received feedback about their physical activity levels. Um, with only one in five of the participants, the practice nurse or the healthcare assistant encouraged goal setting and also emphasized that you know, these step counters are a really good tool to uh, increase your walking. So even when interventions are very brief, I think it just shows how challenging it is to deliver uh, these evidence-based interventions in, in busy primary care. So we thought now, we've, I've spoken about delivery, but of course delivery is only one thing. There's uh, someone receiving this intervention. So the other question would really be interesting, do people actually engage with interventions? Because if, they, you know, if they're not interested or they don't understand what is being delivered, then you know, it might be quite unlikely that they um, you know, can make positive changes. So this was another study um, uh, called SAMS, and um, this was an intervention to uh, help people who had uh, type 2 diabetes to, make their to take their medication as prescribed. And we know that many people don't, it's sort of about around 40% of people don't take medication as prescribed, either because they've got uh, concerns about side effects, or they don't know what the medication is about, or they simply forget to take it. So we developed um, a 30 minutes, so that was sort of a longer consultation delivered by practice nurse in primary care um, to increase people's motivation to take their tablets as prescribed and also to strengthen, so to make sure that people wouldn't forget by strengthening habits. And one way to do that is to ask people to make um, a good plan of where and when they're gonna take their medication. And we were really happy for once, we, you know, it was an intervention that we uh, that actually increased uh, people's adherence. It was a small effect, but um, but yeah, we had lots of questionnaires. We measured, measured people's motivation and also the strength of their habits, and we didn't find any change. So it had worked, but we didn't really know why. Um, and again, I sort of that's um, yeah, again uh, really interested in finding out delivery. So this time we actually audio recorded all of the consultations in the intervention and, and the control group. And my poor research assistant, Laura Lemming, assessed 194 uh, 30 minutes interventions. That was a lot of work and coded them in a lot of detail. And I think what we found was really fascinating. And I can't say, you know, when, whenever you've got an intervention, audio record, listen to it, it really becomes alive and you learn so much from it. So we found that nurse, the practice nurse actually did a really good job at delivering the intervention as expected. We also found that the participants were quite engaged in the discussion. They certainly weren't silent. They were involved in it. But really important, and I think worryingly, we found that um, the nurses had less patient-centered communication in the intervention group than the control group. So we coded for things like you know, ease of delivery, rapport building, 
active listening. And I think what you could just hear was that the practice nurses were quite unfamiliar with this intervention that we developed and were quite hesitant and, and didn't. So that I think another really important lesson, if you've got an intervention that's maybe too different from what people are used to, it might be at the cost of patient-centered communication, which we know is all really important. We found also that the motivational component probably wasn't responsible for the effects because the, the nurse sort of asked the questions and, and quite often when the patient, men, the participant mentioned any side effects or concerns, the practice nurse sort of ignored it and, and went on to the next question. So the barriers really weren't solved. But when we got to the sort of action planning bits, it really became alive, the conversation. And it was the question, simple question, how do you take your medication? And it was just fascinating to hear the stories of people saying, I get out of bed, I go downstairs, my, I see my dog, my dog needs to take a tablet. So that reminds me to take my tablet as well. I go to the kitchen, get the, the pots, the medication pots, I put it on my breakfast tray. So this whole um, sequence of behaviors, even something simple as taking a tablet, a really complex routine that could break at any point really. Um, so it really became alive and, and we asked people to, um, as part of this bit, to define an action plan of how and when they, and where they were going to take this um, medication and sort of thought, well, people were probably going to, you know, come up with a new plan, but they didn't. They basically stated what, what they did. Um, so it led us to conclude that actually if you ask people to verbalize and they also were asked to write it down, a successful routine of taking medication, that that might actually have explained uh, better adherence. So it was a really insightful uh, study. So moving on then, um, there's the consultation. And, but obviously when people go home and you know, if they forget about all the things that they might have been taught as part of the consultation, then you know, they may not use any of those strategies in their daily life. So this was another question that I was really interested in, um, use of intervention strategies at home. And again, another big uh, study in Cambridge uh, led by Simon Griffin. Uh, addition Plus, this was an intervention that targeted uh, multiple behaviours and it was uh, targeting people with recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And the intervention aimed, people, um, aimed to help people to become more active, to eat a healthy diet, to take medication as prescribed and also to stop smoking. And again, we de um, developed this intervention and trained the facilitators to deliver this. And they delivered this intervention in the primary care uh, surgeries across the east of England. Again, quite um, an intensive intervention, seven sessions, four phone calls. And in the end, we found, it seemed to be a repeated story of my career, the intervention was no more effective than what the control group received, and that was intensifying diabetes treatment. And at that time, I think that, that was really emerging. So you're yeah, giving uh, you know, GPs really strict targets of when they were uh, prescribing medication. But even, you know, when an intervention has no effect, there's a lot that we can learn. Um, so um, my colleague uh, Nelly Hanconian spent some time in Cambridge with me and was really interested in, uh, in this. And we had a, a questionnaire um, where we measured, uh, where we just asked people whether they used any of the strategies that they'd been taught as part of the intervention. I think we developed it in a Friday afternoon. It was just a few questions with yes, no, a really straight one. So we asked people about you know, whether they set goals, whether they um, uh, made an action plan, whether they motivate themselves over time. And we find that from this questionnaire that actually people you know, used, said that they were using those strategies that have been taught, sort of from two out of three people used uh, prompts and reminders for behavior change, and four out of five used goal setting. And about one third of the participants said that they used all of those eight strategies to uh, become more active and to eat a healthier diet. And um, um, so we then looked at whether, you know, those, the self-reported use of strategies was associated with uh, behavior change over the course of the year and weight loss. And, um, and Nelly did all these, this fantastic analysis and, and found that people who reported that they had set goals and reviewed goals and prepared for setbacks in relation to their diets were um, those who reported that they, um, ate, they ate less fat over the course of the year. People who mentioned that they had uh, reviewed goals for their diets um, had an increase in plasma vitamin C in the past year, which is a marker of fruit and vegetable intake in the blood. 
And we found, I think, most, maybe the most important finding that people, people said they were using more of those different strategies actually lost more weight over, over the years. So that sort of led us to conclude that maybe you should give people a you know, toolkit of, of strategies that they can uh, choose from. We didn't find any associations with uh, physical activity. Um, though. And um, good, so that was showing that you know, we can learn a lot from you know, what, yeah, the association between what people say they're using and behavior change. Um, so, so far I've talked about sort of looking at this black box by questionnaires and audio recording, but also, of course, qualitative research, so important, asking people what they've done, really, really fascinating. And this is um, another study, uh, MedEx UK, which is led by Amory Menahane, who's over here. And uh, this is an intervention to, that aims to improve a Mediterranean style, so plant-based diet and increasing, phys um, increasing physical activity. And um, the intervention consisted of a, of a website, uh, group sessions, and also food vouchers to account for the increased cost of a Mediterranean diet. And at the end of the intervention, um, we had group discussions with the participants to find out what strategies they've been using. And I think it's been really illuminating to hear from people because some of those strategies were maybe included in our intervention, but some are really creative strategies that people came up with. So quite a lot, people talked a lot about the strategies they used for them to eat a Mediterranean diet, smaller plates, planning, keeping healthy snacks in accessible location, quality purchasing. There was a lot of sharing of recipes, um, both in the group sessions and on what, WhatsApp group. And also in relation to physical activity, people used um, technology to track. Um, they set themselves goals and challenges and also exchanged information with each other about um, physical activity apps and videos. And this, was, this study was actually done as lockdown hit, so uh, there was a lot of exchange about doing physical activity at home. And I think, you know, this, these are so some quotes from participants, which I think is really fascinating. We, we asked people to, or encourage people to eat four tablespoons of olive oil. And you know, one of the participants said they really couldn't find out a way to incorporate it in the cooking, so he just ate it off the spoon. And um, we also asked people not to only be more physically active, but also increase the intensity of it. So there was one participant who said, well, I, w I was, went outside and walked from one lamppost to the other and then ran the next one. Um, I'm not, not sure how sustainable <laughs> that strategy is, but it, it's really fascinating to find out what people uh, have done. Um, so, and finally, um, yeah, just to mention the challenge, um, and Charles said about, you know, we want people to maintain change over time. It's usually challenging. This was the longest study I've ever been involved in, um, Propel study, um, led by Kamlesh Kunti and, and Simon Griffin. Um, and you can see from the phone, you know, when we start, <laughs> there's no smartphone to be seen. And we published the main paper last year. So it was part of my life for a very long time. This was a four-year intervention to promote physical activity. Uh, we had annual group sessions with our participants. We had a, a text messaging program and sent quite tailored text messages to the um, participants and also some phone calls. And we found out that this intervention led to some modest increases in physical activity, but unfortunately that wasn't one year, but after four years that wasn't sustained. Um, and again, I think qualitative research is so important to give us insight into what happens. And, and my colleague Helen Eberall did um, a lot of uh, focus groups and, and group discussions. And it was very clear that four years is a very long time in people's life. All sorts of things were happening. They were getting older. They had illnesses and hospital admissions, life events that just stopped them from being active. And they never recovered from those periods. So you know, sort of building resilience to um, help people to deal with those setbacks is really, really important. Good, that's a lot said. And the final bit of my talk is going to focus on the big challenge of uh, reducing health inequalities through behavior change. Um, and we know health inequalities have got much worse uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And also on top of this, we have the cost of living crisis. Um, and I think all of us during the pandemic had to sort of reflect on, on our research. And I did as well in thinking on, you know, where, where do I want to go next? And I really realized that a lot of the research that we are doing is just not reaching the people who can benefit the most. 
we know that um, unhealthy behaviors cluster. So if you're not very physically active, you're also more likely to eat a poor diet. You're more likely to smoke. And that clustering on healthy behaviors is particularly the case in communities with high socioeconomic disadvantage. And it's really driven by wider determinants like poverty. And it's interesting to know that we've done all this behavior change research over the years. We usually focus on one behavior or two. Actually, rarely focus on multiple behaviors. And we still really don't know how to support multiple behavior change. And added to that, I think there's a huge problem that um, disadvantaged communities are underrepresented in a behavior change research. They stand to gain the most, but yet they are not in involved in research. So when I joined the North Institute of Healthy Aging and the research team of behavioral inequalities and health, I really thought hard, and I actually thought that we're always sort of um, wanting to get our funding bits in. And this time I thought, actually, I don't know. And I think we need to do quite a bit of listening and find out from the communities what would work for them. And we had two... Um, uh, and that's really co called co-production. And also a key thing um, to stress is that we can't do research in, in, a, in a room here on campus. We need to work in partnership with community organizations that are trusted by the communities, um, voluntary organizations, local governments, so much good work going on, and um, NHS and social care. Um, so two big listening exercises we did was, firstly was the co-production partnership, a partnership of 20 organizations who are really embedded in the community who spoke with, um, so they did, the they did the conversations, not us as researchers, with 53 people in areas of high disadvantage. And as part of the Charming project, which was funded by uh, health, UEA Health and Social Care Partners, we had group discussions with uh, 42 stakeholders who worked closely with the communities and 35 people, uh, 36 people with lived experience of self-managing behavior change in really challenging circumstances. And I don't think I've ever learned so much from doing this work last year with a lot of the colleagues here and uh, who've done absolutely fantastic work. So what we learned is that research really is not on the radar of, uh, of these communities. And if it is, um, uh, researchers are met with distrust for, for very valid reasons. And if we are to engage these communities in behavior change research, we need to do things really differently. And this is really the road we're taking in the next few years. The research needs to be led by the communities, not by us as researchers. It needs to be truly co-produced and not us as researchers saying, oh, I've got a nice idea, what do you think of it? But really co-producing things right from the start we need to share power and work as equals in this is partnership. And there needs to be reciprocity. It's, it's no good when researchers go in the community, take, you know, ask people questions and then go out and nothing changes for the communities. There has to be benefit for the communities. So research needs to be done quite differently. We need to place it in the heart of the communities. We need to use appropriate language. I thought it was really revealing. We asked people what healthy aging meant, and people really couldn't make sense of that, that term. Um, we need to make it fun, so people you know, enjoy taking part in research, and I think using what we found is using creative approaches might be a really good um, way to achieve that. And as people said, never underestimate coffee and cake on the table. Really, really important. And what did we learn about supporting behavior change and multiple uh, behaviors? I think we need to do things very differently. We need to give support that is holistic, that focuses on the person, what matters to them, person-centered and not driven by our agenda of what we think the person should change. We need to place our interventions in community assets where people come together, where communities come together, and not asking people to come here to the campus for a group session. People really wanted group support, um, with um, supplement with one-to-one -one support. Support needs to be trauma-informed, so things like you know, building trust and uh, having safe, uh, a safe place to meet and continuity are really important. And again, fun and creative approaches is really what people wanted. And as part of the Charming Project, we tried out some, some of those approaches. And Anna, who's sitting over here, had some wonderful uh, work, magazines with newspapers, people made books and yeah, came, made a collage, and that really was a, a great way to get people talking, rather than 
sharing stories rather than asking them questions. We need to focus on people's strengths rather than the things that they lack and foster hope. And we need to show empathy and understanding of the difficult circumstance that people find themselves in, which means that health is not always a priority. And if we want to help people supporting change, people said they changing a lot of things is really uh, overwhelming. So the message was very clear. We need to encourage change in one behavior based on what matters most. So those are really important lessons that we will carry through in our uh, work um, um, in, in the research theme and, and more widely. Good, so I think I've come to my conclusion. I look at the time, it's about time. And so I think I've hoped that I've set out that behavioral science has enabled us to First, to develop a shared language for how we describe behavior change interventions, which has helped us to, um, you know, to build an evidence base of what works and what doesn't work in supporting behavior change. I think it has also enabled us to get a, gain an in-depth understanding of how interventions achieve behavior change and what strategies people use themselves. And I think I've also illustrated the challenges of intervention delivery in the real world. And, and I think the solution to that is really co-producing with everyone involved and having something as practicable, feasible and acceptable. And, and as I said just uh, shortly ago, we need to co-produce research in partnerships to engage uh, communities, disadvantaged communities in research. So I've sort of come to the end, but um, as I said, I, this has been fantastic teamwork. You may have seen from all the journal articles so many people I've worked with over the years. And so there's a lot of thank yous are due. And I want to start firstly with the funders who have so gener generously supported my research over the years. I want to, I'm really, really lucky to work in the School of Health Sciences. It's a fantastic place to work. And it's lovely to see uh, uh, my colleagues here tonight and um, very grateful to be part also of the Behavioral Implementation Science Group. and work for being part of the wider faculty of medicine and health sciences, which is really thriving um, in terms of research and education. And, um, and yeah, and also the Norwich Institute of Healthy Aging, fantastic to, uh, to be working there and, and thinking about doing research differently. And before I thank everyone else, I really want to thank first, really importantly, participants and representatives of patients and the public Without them, there wouldn't be any research. There wouldn't have been this inaugural lecture. And I'm always really, um, you know, so quite astonished of how people can give up so much of, th of their time and their efforts to, to help us to, um, you know, to generate evidence to uh, support behavior change. So thank you, thank you. And then a lot of colleagues here on the slide. If you're, if you're not on the slide, that's because I had trouble finding your picture or I ran out of space, but you know who you are. Um, I stand on the shoulder of giants and absolutely indebted to my very wonderful colleagues at, at the University of Cambridge, um, all the study teams that I've worked with. I've always worked as part of really big uh, research teams. And so thank you to all the, all the people I've worked with in those big studies. And uh, thank you for, to the colleagues here at the UEA in the School of Health Sciences, Norris Institute of Healthy Aging, and my PhD students uh, with you know, I've learned so much from all of them, and I keep learning. Absolutely great to work with, and as well as learning from their uh, supervisory teams. And I want to thank my international colleagues and also my colleagues at the European Health Psychology Society, which is such a, a wonderful family to work with, and really ensuring that you know health psychology and behavioral science is you know our voice is heard not just in the UK and not just around Europe, but across the world. And um, also really want to thank all the, the people, my non-academic colleagues, that's a very bad term to use, <laughs> colleagues, community organisations, voluntary organisations, local government, health and social care, and there's quite a few of you here, and it's an absolute joy to work with you, and I learn, I've learned so much from you, and really look forward to continuing the collaboration. Um, I also want to really want to thank my family, uh, both my English family and my Dutch family, and my Dutch family is online, and I want to thank my parents for letting me pursue the path that I wanted to pursue, even though they may not have always understood, understood what path I wanted to pursue, but they have always been really, really supportive. And uh, last but not least, my wonderful Ian, who sits here, my husband, 
I think he'll be very glad when he doesn't need to, <laughs> doesn't have to worry, hear the word inaugural anymore. <laughs> and, <laughs> or other, <laughs> really, really patiently listening to stories about research and you know, always reminding me there is a big world beyond research and uh, to be enjoyed and had. And I think we all know work-life balance can be really um, challenging at times. So thank you for your support and encouragement. And I also want to thank my two dogs, my late Alfie and uh, our current dog, Bella, for dogs are great at living in the present and enjoying the present. So they always remind me to enjoy the present and not worry too much about the future. And then you put in a camper van and some musical instruments and uh, yeah, got a good work balance. So, uh, so yeah, thank you very much. And I think I'm gonna leave it here. I might have run a bit over time, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for such a wonderful, wonderful um, lecture. Absolutely fascinating. And what a journey you've been on. It's been, it's been wonderful to hear about these, these stories. And um, um, your interest in people, your interest in how things work, um, it really shone through. And that gallery of, of folk that you've worked with, that's, that's really amazing. Um, I always tell my PhD students, um, develop your networks and I think if you can't get your network of people all on one slide that's that's real success so thank you. <laughs> um, uh, questions then from the floor. I'm opening it up to you. Yes Anne-Marie. <laughs> Hannah's, Hannah's doing the running with the microphone. Wendy, thank you for a stunning lecture and congratulations on just a wonderful career and I'm one of the lucky ones who get to work beside you <laughs> most days. <laughs> so I just had a question about, um, you, you mentioned on one slide, behaviour change approaches and I know we tend to deliver our interventions where the same components are delivered to everyone. Is there any move on the field to kind of make the intervention components bespoke to the individual, maybe to suit their personality or their context or, you know, other things, and to, to personalise it, I suppose, is my question. Great, thank you. It's a great question, Amory, and a privilege to work with you too. <laughs> um, yes, definitely. And I, I yeah, I, the one-size-fits-all approach, I think that's, you know, I think we can almost put that to bed. Different things work for different people. Um, and... I guess, you know, with face-to-face -face interventions, it's, I, th I think quite often is you can give people like a, a toolkit and, and a range of strategies that's, um, that they could use. And I think people will use the thing that, that works for them. And um, we might be a little way off of thinking, you know, how we can tailor, I think often in a face-to-face in -face consultation, you can adapt that delivery to the person and, and their reactions. And, and I think when you do digital intervention as well, you can tailor approaches um, to the individual too. Um, yeah, I think there are some techniques, I think, when people are maybe, you know, they lack motivation or, or, or maybe the capability to change, there, there are certain strategies or approaches that might work better than, you know, someone's already starting to make changes and build it into a habit. So yeah, definitely, I, I would say move, yeah, we need to, and I think we have moved from beyond delivering the same thing to everyone to thinking about, you know, what works for the person. And it's more about the, the function of what we're doing rather than the form. Um, so, yeah, we want to achieve behaviour change. We'll do it in different ways. I hope that's answered your question. <laughs> Thank you for that great question and fantastic answer. Um, anyone else from the floor want to ask a question? Oh. Charles, yes, please. Thank you. I'd also like to say thank you for such a fantastic lecture. Um, so I was really struck by the evidence you provided that the intervention wasn't actually being delivered in the way that perhaps it was thought it would be. And I mean, the numbers were really quite striking. 
and to what extent can you then go back and look at the data set again and say, well, I know in this individual it was delivered well and compared with these individuals where it wasn't delivered well and have another look at the whole data set based on that um, evidence you've got as to the effectiveness? That's a really good question, Charles. Thank you. We did actually did that in, I think it was in the proactive trial, and we looked at um, yeah, the adherence you know, facilitator adherence to delivery and, and physical activity change in the participants, but actually didn't find an association um, between that. So it, it wasn't like if the intervention was better delivered necessarily, people um, increased their physical activity more, which is also fascinating by itself, isn't it? It mm -hmm. just tells that delivery is only one bit of this black box, but it's what people do with it at home. I also think that that's another thing I didn't touch upon, that with these, these trials, we do very intensive measurements as well. Um, you know, it's at, at the start, a baseline, and I think measurement itself is, is such a powerful behavior change uh, strategy. So I think that's also a challenge sometimes that um, even, you know, an intervention might be delivered, but all these measures have been, um, you know, provided, and they could also explain the effects and the outcomes that you find. So yeah, and some of the studies, my colleagues have randomized people to getting baseline measures or not and find out that those measures, yeah, do change people's behaviors. Mm -hmm. Just fill in a questionnaire mm -hmm. <laughs> about physical activity makes you more active. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, it makes me think about why my New Year's resolutions aren't working. Um, <laughs> so uh, any other questions? I think we've got time for probably just one more question from the floor. No, no one? Okay, everybody wants to. There's, there's no questions, um, but just a lot of love coming from your family oh, online. Um, online oh. So I just wanted to share that with you from your younger sister, is it Heidi? Heidi. Yes, so oh, she lovely. says to send you lots of love and a big kiss and a hug as well. So lots of um, <laughs> a big outpouring there for you. How lovely, okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name's Kenda Crozier. I'm the, um, the head of the School of Health Sciences, and I have to say I'm very, very proud to have um, Professor Wendy Hardiman as part of our community. Thank you very much. I hope you'll just join me in um, putting your hands together for Wendy.